Brian Flores uses offensive line protection rules against them. Let me show you how on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Luke Braun, and you can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, including SiriusXM and the SiriusXM app, where you can also find live broadcasts of all the games. You can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. And if you are watching on YouTube and you stick around all the way until the end of the video, you will be sent directly into a 24-7 rotation of all Minnesota Locked On Sports channels. That's Locked On Vikings, Locked On Wolves. They've got some stuff to talk about. <laughs> Wild twins even in the offseason, everything. So you can check all of that out. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So today's episode is uh, the the film, filmy reviewee Wednesday so there's three things that I want to do on this filmy reviewee Wednesday. That's the official name. That's the industry term. Um, <laughs> first off, Brian Flores blitzes have mystified offenses all year, and they've gotten all kinds of free rushers. I want to talk about exactly how he's doing that. Uh, also, how Jalen Naylor do? I uh, had an article come out today, Wednesday, on the Wide Left Substack. That's Arif Hassan's Substack. I did a little guest column there about Jalen Naylor and the game that he had. He only had one catch, but he was in on every passing play, basically. Uh, I think except for like a couple of series where he was replaced by like Tristan Jackson uh, or Nikhil Harry. So what he did and if we can take anything away from that, if we can learn anything from that and that sort of leads into Joshua Dobbs and progressions and hopefully what we can, can like where we can continue to see growth as he gets more and more comfortable and familiar with being a Minnesota Viking. But let's start on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, the Brian Flores blitz system speaks for itself. The results speak for themselves, right? And and he's, you know, the, the frequency of these blitzes is insane, leads the league in uh, six or more pass rushers, leads the league in three pass rushers. That is the weird thing that we are now, and it's going great. The Vikings defense has found its stride here in the last month or, or six weeks or so. Um, So, I want to get technical about how offensive lines try to attack this kind of approach and how Brian Flores is using those rules against the offensive lines. But before you get too deep into what the defense does, you kind of have to understand the system that you're attacking. So um, there's going to be a couple of things here. For one, I have a video on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Luke Braun NFL. Go check it out if you're interested in high, uh, high detail, in-depth film analysis. Um, there is one from last week. Don't even have to be a patron to watch it. So go check it out. Uh, that it's, it's the, the thumbnail is a big pink picture with Garrett Bradbury on it. That says learn pass pro. It's a big old pass protection tutorial about how NFL teams approach pass protection in particular, how they approach slide protections. Um, where it's not just block the guy in front of you. It's not just man on man. It's typically man on man and half the protection and the other half of the protection is a slide where everyone blocks the guy to that side of them. If it's a slide left, you block the guy to your left and vice versa. Uh, so who does what, right? Who does who is sliding and who is staying on the man side? And you're probably immediately visualizing the the first thing that a defensive coach might want to attack. If there's a three-man slide to the left, that means the center is blocking to his left, 
The guard is blocking to his left. The tackle is blocking to his left. But what about the right guard who is not part of the slide? He is blocking man to man. He is blocking a single person, which kind of pins him to that person, which means that gap to the guard to the right guard's left side is going to be really far open, right? The, wherever the slide is going away from that first gap to the backside of the slide, away from the slide, is going to be open. And that's typically a running back's job. If there is no running back, that makes things a little easier for the blitz. But typically, that's where a running back will often be looking. you, know, you got to protect that A gap or that B cap or, or whichever it was. Um, if you want to know more about how teams do determine who's on the slide and who's on the man side you gotta please go watch that patreon video it goes into way more depth and there's visuals and stuff this is a podcast a lot of people are listening in their cars so I, I can't really go too deep on the visuals on this lest i totally leave a whole bunch of you behind which i don't want to do um so suffice it to say this it is a cover to uncovered system so counting in from basically where the uh where the slide is not going to be so uh, away from the, the called person. Essentially, they'll call out a linebacker and the slide will go away from that linebacker. Uh, so you count inward. So is the tackle covered? Which means does he have a guy to the outside of him? If there is somebody to the gap of the outside of him, which there very often is, the tackle is covered. Then is the guard covered? And it depends on the front that you get. If the guard is covered, you go to the center. If the center is covered, you go and so on and so forth until you find somebody who is uncovered. So let's say that first guard is uncovered, the second lineman you look at. Everybody from the, from him onward is in the slide. So that would be a four-man slide, and they block the four most dangerous, including all the bigs, all the defensive linemen, right? So think about that from the defensive perspective. Um, think about if you are Brian Flores, you're trying to design a blitz, and you go, okay, I'll do this from a front where I leave the left guard uncovered. So I know it's going to be a four man slide, assuming they slide it to that side and you kind of have to be ready for if they slide it to one side or the other. Um, or maybe, you know how they like to declare those protections, right? Now you can manipulate that system with a little more certainty, but let's say that we know that it's going to be a four man slide. How are you attacking that? Personally, I like attacking up that, that B gap, wherever that, that guard is going away from, right? Or perhaps rushing two people at the, the singular tackle who's in man to man, right? And he can only choose one of them. Depending on where the running back is, do you attack, uh, elsewhere that, um, you know, forces that running back to make a really difficult block, which is how, uh, Josh Metellus got in on one against the saints that forced an incompletion, that actually was schematically blocked up perfectly by the Saints. On the whiteboard, it should have worked, but it was just too hard of an assignment for Jamal Williams. He couldn't get there, and Metellus got the QB hit. Um, this same logic led to the Makai Blackman interception. Josh Metellus lights up Jameis Winston on that one, and the ball floats into nowhere, and it just becomes a jump ball that Makai Blackman comes down with. And it was a lot of that same logic of understanding that the front that we start in is going to determine the protection. It's like a really key thing there. How we align, not who rushes and who doesn't, just how we align determines the protection we see. And so if we can learn the system that that team goes with, and there's enough differences from team to team where it can't just you can't just say universal language and get a bunch of free, free uh, rushers. But if you can figure that out, then you can start to really manipulate things. Then you get into the shifts and a whole bunch of the other crazy stuff that Brian Flores was doing. Think about covered, uncovered again. Let's say that left guard is uncovered. So the first guard that you look at is uncovered. We're going to have a four man slide. But then at the very end of the, like at the at very end of the pre snap process, like right at the snap cadence, somebody shifts over and that guard becomes covered. So a four man slide just had to turn into a three man slide. And everybody off on the offensive line has to know that and understand that all of their angles and all of their blocking math just changed on a dime and they have to process it really quickly. I could go on about this forever and I plan to on Patreon. So go uh, to patreon.com slash Luke Brown NFL, watch the pass pro tutorial, watch the blitz thing. I'll show a bunch of examples uh, and we can all learn a whole bunch together. But let's flip to the offensive side of the ball. Talk a little bit about Jalen Naylor, where he went, what he did, 
Turns out he uh, burned a lot of calories, I guess. <laughs> and also Josh Dobbs' role in that. And also just like in a more general sense. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. It's that time of year where it is time to start filling new positions, expanding if that's applicable to you and whether you are a hiring manager at a company or a small business owner that needs to do all of that yourself. LinkedIn is an invaluable tool to help you through all that. For one, it's LinkedIn. Everyone's on it. But for two, it has all kinds of helpful tools like screening questions and stuff that can help you narrow down that giant pool of applicants into people who are actually right for you and your company. Just add the purple hashtag hiring frame to spread the word that you're hiring, let the applicants roll in, and then let LinkedIn help you narrow it down to who you actually want to interview. Hiring is not a passive process and it is not a cookie cutter process. Everybody has their own styles and their own things that they are looking for. LinkedIn understands that and it's why small businesses rate them number one at this. So go to linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Locked on Vikings is also brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one one sports book. FanDuel is always giving out all kinds of really cool promos and bonuses, and their latest one is no exception. If you are new to FanDuel, you've been thinking about joining, it is a great time to do it. If you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, sign up at that URL, make any $5 money line bet, win that bet, and you get $150 back in bonus bets for a $5 money line bet on anyone. Uh, any favorite, no matter how big, you can get 30 to 1 odds on that functionally. 150 bucks on a $5 bet. So go to fanduel.com slash locked on, and they've got all kinds of other stuff, not just the money line, spreads, player props, crazy parlays, all sorts of stuff. Safe, secure, super easy, easy to use, and they pay out instantly when you win. So go to fanduel.com slash locked on and get going on your NFL grambles. Fanduel, official partner of the NFL. Thanks again for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. When you are done here, go check out the 24 uh, 7 channels that we have going on. We've got the Locked On Sports Today one, which is like all sports. We have the Locked On Minnesota Sports one, which you don't even have to lift a finger if you watch it on YouTube. It's just going to kick you right over to that one uh, after this show ends. But let's talk about Jalen Naylor. So somebody asked a Twitter Tuesday question that I couldn't really answer yesterday. Uh, Cause I was like working on, I was like in the middle of working on this when I was recording it, but like, Hey, how Jalen Naylor do, uh, could we see anything on tape? And the answer is sure. Of course. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's one catch, right? There's one catch. So he's not going to get the best. Like I think PFF graded him pretty low and all that. Like I, I, it's not going to be a game where you get a lot out of the statistics. Um, but I still think that you can watch and learn some of the things that he did well and, and not well. And the first question you have to ask is, OK, why didn't he get targeted? Was he not getting open? That's the the real question. And I think it was inconsistent. It, he was getting open some. I think he was open more than his stats would reflect. Like, I think one catch for 16 yards underrates the day that he had. But I don't think he was like secretly dusting dudes all over the place. But here's the deal. He was on the backside of the play. All the time. Uh, I charted this out. Out of 42 genuine routes run, he was on the backside for 30 of them. Um, that's, I mean, two-thirds of the time he was he was on the backside. So that's going to make it hard to get targeted when you got a quarterback who's in who's only been there for 12 days. And while Joshua Dobbs was going through progressions, he often wouldn't get that deep in him. And it's not really, like, wrong. <laughs> to not get that deep in those progressions because it means you would have to come off of Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson. You'd have to say, I'm not throwing to those two guys. I'm throwing to Jalen Naylor instead. Guess what? Those guys got open a good amount. And so the Vikings had a passing game in this one that was pretty prolific, especially in the first half. Um, the side effect of that is that you never really get to the backside basic, which, I mean, look, Justin Jefferson made a living off of backside basics when Kirk, when he and Kirk Cousins were going um cousins would get through one and two very quickly and it would still kind of require him to like come off of a justin jefferson route right uh but he would get to that backside basic it'd be like kj osborne or or it would be you know osborne and hawkinson on the front side 
And, you know, you'd read one, you'd read two, and you'd go back to three, and there's Jeffers. So there's no shame in being the third read or the fourth read in a route progression. I think on the whole, once you chart it out and say, man, he was on the backside, like, kind of all the time, it does reflect that the staff, like, trusted Addison and Hawkinson, and I would even say Brandon Powell more. And it leads to this interesting thing, uh, which... I just did the article at, at uh, Wide Left, explores this idea. What is a wide receiver to? Is it the guy that does more in the pass game? Is it the guy that's higher in the progression more often? Because then that was Brandon Powell. Or is it the guy that got more snaps? In which case it's Jalen Naylor. Who, who you actually define that as is a debate that you can have some fun with if you want. Uh, but for me, I'm satisfied with just kind of pointing out that that's the distinction. Jalen Naylor played more, probably because he blocks, but Brandon Powell seemed to be favored in the passing game. Whichever one you want to call two and three, that's between you and your God. <laughs> and honestly, wide receiver two is still TJ Hawkinson, so it's kind of a moot point anyways. And it's an especially moot point because KJ Osborne coming through concussion protocol, Justin Jefferson could be back next week. We're watching injury statuses and stuff for that, so... Uh, yeah, who cares, right? But it is this sort of unfortunate thing for Jalen Naylor himself where he misses seven games due to injury, right? Of uh, Being on IR with his hamstring injury. He also missed most of camp with a different injury. So he has had a rough year of, of injuries and he finally gets back. And not only is he back in the building, uh, and healthy and active back on the active roster, but Two guys that are ahead of him on the depth chart are hurt in Osborne and Jefferson. So he actually has the opportunity to be wide receiver two or three or whatever you want to call it, but to, to get real run and he, and he plays over 60 snaps uh, and he ends up running a whole bunch of cardio <laughs> because he's in the backside of a play that the quarterback who's been here for 12 days is never going to get to. And there is a certain, there's a, there's a dignity in that, I guess, uh, in the guy that just runs the clear outs, you know, the guy that says, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll run that route. And it's part of the, you know, it's part of the concept. It's if, if the safety comes over with me the way that he's supposed to, then I did my job. Right. But you're never going to get any stats and you're never going to get the glory. And, and it could even be a little frustrating. Um, I remember this exact thing happening to Stefan Diggs in 2019 where when the Vikings would pass, he would be on the backside. Maybe Cousins would alert him or maybe Cousins would, you know, find other ways to um, th to to make that something that, you know, gets him the ball. He would be like the hot route against a blitz or something like that. Like he would have like a vital role, but there would be a lot of situations where that role will just never get the ball, even though Diggs would get open. He got super frustrated with that. Um, so it's not fun. And I think the expectation is for players to just sort of put their head down and do the dirty work. And even though they're not going to get any glory, the expectation is for them is to just kind of like take that on the chin. But I think it's worth some commendation at least. Um, but what we can do is then we learn about Jalen Naylor because we don't need him to get the ball for us to be able to like watch his route. Right. And the, the backside basic in particular, a 12 to 14 yard in route, uh, is a pretty good one to evaluate things on because it usually comes with best release, right? You, your release is not determined for you. Sometimes on go routes, you must release to the outside or you must release to the inside, depending on like concept stuff. Um, so we don't have to deal with any of that. It's a longish route, right? We're not, we're not, uh, evaluating people on how they run stick. It's a, it's a longish route with a big stem. You got to do some setup. You get off man coverage a lot. And, uh, it's also like a, got a good cut in it. So you can like evaluate that explosiveness. And I would say right now, the thing that is preventing Jalen Naylor from say supplanting KJ Osborne on the depth chart, right? What's the difference between KJ Osborne and Jalen Naylor that makes KJ Osborne a better receiver? To me, the answer is explosiveness, like physical explosiveness. And I don't know if that's an athleticism thing with Naylor necessarily, um, to me, it looks like he could sink his hips more on those breaks, but that's just me. And I'm certainly not like wide receiver is one that I, I don't feel nearly as confident about as I do other positions. So big grain of salt on that, but 
that's the only real consistent gripe that I would have. Everything else seems good. I mean, the releases are, I, I like his releases a lot, actually. I like the the quickness of his footwork. I like that fact that he's really good at getting skinny. So if you're going to try to press Jalen Naylor, he's really good at kind of giving you the side of his shoulder, which is a smaller target. Uh, he's good, good at doing that at the top of his route as well, like at the break of his route as well, just turning his shoulders so that you can't get a hand on him or try to disrupt that break at all. Um, and he's precise with how he leans things or doesn't lean them, uh, with his stems where you're supposed to stem inside or outside just a little bit. Uh, and especially when you're running a basic, you kind of want to, um, bubble that a little bit and sort of drift upfield like a yard, like a deliberate yard. You don't want to just drift upfield kind of haphazardly that's interceptiony. But if you drift up, drift upfield like a yard just to, to deepen the defensive back and then carve it back down, um, and work back toward the ball so that you take away that interception angle. That's kind of the best way to run those types of things. He's really consistent about that. So there's a lot to like with Jalen Naylor. I don't think that his lack of production is something that you should hold against him at all. Uh, I mean, Hey, look, maybe the coaching staff just does prefer Brandon Powell. Take that for what you will. But, um, I don't know. There's a, a lot to like, I think more to like than there is not to like, but probably moot anyways. Cause a bunch of guys are coming back soon. Um, but Hey, Joshua Dobbs, not necessarily going through deep into those progressions. Can we still feel okay about this offense? Is that even a problem? That's kind of the next question we got to go answer. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. It is daily fantasy made easy, but it's not daily fantasy the way that you are familiar with it because daily fantasy the way that you are familiar with it sucks. Format of Prize Picks is that you pick two to six of your favorite players, and it can be any combination of positions. It can be six quarterbacks, it can be two wide receivers, two running backs. You don't have to do like a whole lineup, and it's just you versus the house. So that's way easier than trying to enter a pool of 600,000 people and, you know, place in the top 10 of that, right? Uh, just you versus the house prize picks has their projection for how many yards or touchdowns or fantasy points or whatever that player will get. Make your selection more than or less than their prize picks projection. You smash it all together and get a better payout. Uh, you can go to prizepickscom slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL on your first deposit. And you can get that matched up to a hundred dollars prizepickscom slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. I think the question on everybody's mind that will go around now for the next few days as we head into the Broncos game is, okay, so now when does Joshua Dobbs turn into a pumpkin, right? This is all a great story. Everyone had their fun. When are we all going to get slapped in the face? And I, I don't really like thinking about things that way. Just things can be fun until they're not. Like, enjoy it, you know. I, I actually, Josh Dobbs had a great phrase on this, which is, be where your feet are, right? I uh, said that in a press conference. I really like that. Be where your feet are. You know, you don't have to think about what happened six weeks from now. We'll think about that six weeks from now. But right now he is going off to play the Broncos. And the question remains, is he still going to be good? Or was that just like a fluke and everything is just fluky? And I think you can look at the tape and you can see what's fluky and what is it, right? For me, the scramble touchdown stuff, that that's going to dry up. You know, teams are going to figure out how to play him. They're going to figure out how to zone him off so that he can't do that as well. Right. Mobile quarterbacking gives you a lot of advantages. I love mobile quarterbacks. Mobile, absolutely better than immobile. It's just like a tool that is in your toolbox that makes you a better quarterback. Um, but from a defensive perspective, it's not like that's a new trick. <laughs> you know, everybody's got their thing for mobile quarterbacks and the more tape that gets out on him, the more teams are going to start to commit to those strategies, which then prevent presents a new challenge for O'Connell, which is how to punish them. And the cat and mouse game goes onward. Um, but all that is to say, there's going to be a day when somebody comes and plays mobile quarterbacking really well. It says, yeah, Joshua Dobbs, you're a pretty fast quarterback, but we got fast dudes too. And you can't scramble on us. You're going to have to beat us through the air. Right? So, Let's take all of that away, right? Take all of the scramble nonsense away and say, if we just treated Joshua Dobbs as a pocket passer, we just said this dude, let's just like pretend every play where he like escaped the pocket doesn't count, which is deeply unfair to him. But let's hold him to that unfair standard and see what we come out just for the science of it. 
um, you, 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 you still get a whole bunch of really great plays. You get plays where he reads the full field and then either goes to a check down or runs, which is his own check down, right? That's you kind of become your own check down. Um, you have that really cool TJ Hawkinson touchdown and in particular mechanically, boy, the Vikings did not go easy on him. I, I, that's something I want to emphasize that the, the Vikings did not play this thing on easy mode at all. Kevin O'Connell said like, no, we had a full compliment. We had a full game plan. Um, and it's easy to say that, but I, I would forgive you if you're still a little skeptical. Maybe he's just gassing up his, his guy, right? No, I don't think he's lying at all. Uh, you see Joshua Dobbs coming to the line. He's canning plays. He's making protection adjustments. A huge part of O'Connell's offense happens pre-snap. And I don't cover other McVay Shanahan teams closely enough to know just how common it is with them. We'll have to ask when we, if and when we, we play against them on crossover Thursday, but I know that like a big key to Kevin O'Connell, if you want to know, like how is Kevin O'Connell scheming all this stuff up? It's with information gathering pre-snap. He'll come to the line. You'll do a hard count. You'll see if anyone flinches. And if anyone flinches, maybe they're coming, right? Or you understand that they're, you know, if the safety flinches and, and takes two steps toward the line of scrimmage, you know that he's rolling and you know that they're doing a ripples rotation. And now you can understand if your play call is going to work or not. Or are they going to rotate their coverage perfectly so that it covers everything and you have to can into the next play? And in doing that, you can essentially, let's let's say you have a play called that is great against every coverage, but is a horrible play call against cover two. And unfortunately, the defense is not going to kindly tell you which coverage they're, they're in before you get that play in, right? You can't exactly say, well, we'll ju we just won't call that when they're in cover two then because you won't, don't get to know that. Until you do a hard count, you figure out that because of the way the safety rolled at your hard count, that they're going to be in cover two. And so you only call that play with a hard count into, you know, okay, we'll just can do a run play if they're doing that, right? If the safeties are coming off like that, then we'll just can to, to, to zone. And then you can have a play call. I mean, there's no play that beats every coverage, right? Uh, or if it is, it's something like four verticals that everybody has or slant flat that everybody has, right? That is like good against every cover sticks that like all that stuff uh, is at least reasonable against every coverage. And there's a reason it's in everybody's playbook. But if you have a concept that is going to be a staple for you, you can design that play to be, you know, three of the four major coverage categories. Uh, and if it loses to the fourth one, you can just hard count and can out of it if you have to. Having access to that is fantastic. Um, so mentally, all of the complexities, all the stuff that made Kirk Cousins need to play card on his wristband and come out, come out after the game and say, man, these are getting long. Like <laughs> All of that stuff seems to be in play for Joshua Dobbs already. But also physically, the degree of difficulty is high. I mean, like that TJ Hawkinson touchdown. It's just a really, really tough throw. And he had, he made some other difficult throws or attempted some other difficult throws, didn't make all of them. Um, you know, corner routes and stuff, things on the run. So that's part of it. But also just stuff like doing a, a, a toss and then boot action the other way just requires a lot of hip flexibility. It's just like a really difficult thing to do. Um, or one of my favorites is the counter run where you fake, you know, the the running back will take a counter step to the left uh, and everybody down blocks to the left and it's supposed to look like zone to the left, but then you have one puller and you run to the right, right? So the running back takes a step to the left and then runs to the right. And you'll actually have the quarterback get in on that too by holding the ball out to the left like he's going to hand it off and then switching it in his hand, getting it into the bread basket, going to the right, um... That's really hard. Like, it's just physically really hard to do with any semblance of timing. And it was all over the place in the Saints game. They had they have overcome that particular hurdle. When it comes to progressions, I talked about this a little bit with the Naylor thing, he is, Dobbs is going through those progressions. He's not going through them as quickly as, as Kirk Cousins, uh, or Jaron Hall for that matter. But he is progressing. He's not staring down first reads or doing any of that stuff. You usually get super worried about with like rookie quarterbacks or, you know, guys that are new to teams or guys that just flat out suck. Right. So you're, you're not getting those issues. 
So I think the next couple of games, I'll, I'll still give them a little bit of a pass for certain like mesh problem or mesh point issues and protection issues and stuff. Uh, Cause you still only been here for 12 days, but I think in the next couple of games, it seems to me like he has the offense as down as you, as, as he needs to have it. So we can, I think be a little bit more straight up in the way that we evaluate him. Um, so let's keep it rolling tomorrow is a uh, crossover Thursday. So we're going to talk to locked on Broncos excited for that Friday's bold predictions and all of that good stuff as well. See y'all for that. And as always skull.